Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Welcome to the Holistic Survival Show with Jason Hartman. The economic storm brewing around the world is set to spill into all aspects of our lives. Are you prepared? Where are you going to turn for the critical life skills necessary to survive and prosper? The Holistic Survival Show is your family's insurance for a better life. Jason will teach you to think independently, to understand threats, and how to create the ultimate action plan. Sudden change or worst case scenario, you'll be ready. Welcome to Holistic Survival, your key resource for protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Holistic Survival Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we talk about protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in these uncertain times. We have a great interview for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds on the Holistic Survival Show. And by the way, be sure to visit our website at holisticsurvival.com. You can subscribe to our blog, which is totally free, has loads of great information, and there's just a lot of good content for you on the site. So make sure you take advantage of that at holisticsurvival.com. We'll be right back. It's my pleasure to welcome Craig B. Hewlett back to the show. You heard him on before. He is an expert in so many areas, and he's got such a a fascinating life, and he writes about such fascinating topics, everything from urban escape, evasion and survival, military issues, terrorism, business, economics, security, just a whole bunch of great things. And Craig, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, good. It's good to have you back on. And you're located up in the uh, Seattle area, is that correct? Right, up around the old growth rainforest. I actually live in the rainforest itself, about seven to ten miles back into the rainforest. Fantastic. Well, I don't know where we should start. I mean, your your work and your uh, your thinking is so broad, and you cover so many issues. But I would definitely like to make sure we talk about drones. I am extremely concerned about drone technology being used in American airspace. I was concerned about it last year when Obama signed it into law. It seems like not too many people were concerned back then. But now, finally, I'm starting to hear a lot of concerns about it. I've heard that these drones are being equipped for crowd and riot control. And it it seems unconstitutional to me. It seems like the military being used on American soil... What are your thoughts, uh, and what's going on with well, the drone issue the, lately? Drones are already being used on American soil. Um, that's one of the disheartening aspects to it. In fact, the Seattle PD was one of the first cities to receive a FEMA uh, or FAA-approved um, usage of a drone, and that was last year around June. Fortunately, um, or maybe not all that fortunately, um, when they pr- introduced the drones to a town meeting, the town meeting was completely overtaken by protesters. So, you know, that was a good sign. And, was, and they were protesters from all, all areas, all walks of, of life were there. And so that was heartening. The, the American people are taking drone deployment here domestically very seriously. Now, the fact that they're already deployed is one thing, but FAA has already announced and Homeland Security uh, and simultaneously, which... By the way, Homeland Security is kind of usurping all the powers reserved to the Pentagon, the CIA, the FBI. Even the old stalwarts of of the FBI are concerned that Homeland Security is usurping everybody's power and placing it under one roof, responsible and reporting only to the president. So that's a concern. While it hasn't come to fruition, I can tell you with my work with people in, in law enforcement, The only people I work with in law enforcement are intel guys. I don't work with street cops or anything like that. And I've never carried a badge. I'm strictly a consultant and an analyst. But I can tell you they're very concerned with the reach of Homeland Security already, including the FBI. And the FAA is predicting 30,000 drones will be in American skies in less than a decade. Wow. That That is just a shocking number. And I mean, will these drones be weaponized? Is that true? Well, the first thing the Seattle PD police chief asks is, can we outfit him with 12-gauge shotguns? Unbelievable. 
So, and yes, and of course they will be. I mean, they can say they won't be. They can say whatever they want. But these, these will be assigned specifically to federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies backed up by Homeland Security. So if anybody is deemed a threat to the federal government and the threat level and the threat aspects that they describe in Homeland Security documents are so vague as to be meaningless, in fact, they issued a document recently on domestic terrorism, and it included people that would be looked at and considered potential terrorist threats simply because they were supporters of Ron Paul. Or, if they <laughs> or, had or, large... maybe, they're, or maybe they're veterans. I remember when, uh, was it Nancy Pelosi talking about that uh, about a year and a half, two years ago? Unbelievable. You mean veterans of the war? Yeah, yeah, our own veterans. They're being viewed as potential threats. Well, they've already, if you've come home from the war and you've been injured physically, mentally, or under treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, you've already received a letter from the VA denying you the right to keep and bear arms. Unbelievable. I mean, That's this already is, taken this is, place. This is shocking. But elicited in the domestic terrorism document is, is includes things like, if you belong to a group whose religious beliefs are anti-government and you store a lot of food, in other words, they perfectly described the Mormons. The Mormons, yeah, right. So, but the document itself should be perused. I have a copy of it on my website. In fact, everything I'll discuss here, there will be a PDF file on my website. You may have to go into the first, second, third pages to find them, but they're all outlined. They're all available for free with all the documentation. This is the same format I used to use before computers. I would create a document. I would make my argument. And then supply, rather than footnotes for people to have to look up, I supply the document themselves. So nothing I'm saying here hasn't been documented. If you can refute the documentation, then I'll accept you've got a good argument against what I'm saying. But until that time, all I can tell you is nothing like this has happened in this country in the last 35 to 40 years that I've been public, doing public work about government and policies and, and my analysis almost 40 years now, and I've never seen anything like the last three years of movement towards complete dissipation, infringement of, or elimination of certain aspects of the 10 Bill of Rights. It's, I've never seen anything like it. Obama is less transparent than Bush ever was. He's violated and infringed upon civil rights far more than Bush ever did. He's taken what Bush did do to levels that I think would surprise Bush if he cared. But, of course, we know George W. doesn't care about anything. So, you know, we're in a situation that I've never seen happen, and I never thought I'd see happen in my lifetime. If there's any part of my analysis I'm critical of towards myself, it's that I thought I would be probably dead by now before I saw this move to taking this country in a direction where civil liberties, the Bill of Rights, become absolutely meaningless. Very good point. Very good point. It's being trampled on like crazy. In fact, I have a funny thing that a friend of mine posted on Facebook today, and it says it was the picture of George Bush, and he uh, is kind of waving with that, that billboard. You've probably seen it. It says, Miss Me Yet? And then the caption below it says, Nope, we can hardly even tell you left. <laughs> Obama is the total continuation of the Bush policies and then some. <laughs> well, if you interviewed me as far back as I recall, it was quite a long time ago. I said when Obama got elected that he fell into the White House, that he was never the choice of anybody, Democrat or Republican, that because the Democrats put forward such a list that included people so distasteful to Wall Street, even Karl Rove help got get rid of some of them. So, you know, Obama was just the one left standing. He was completely un unqualified to be in the White House. Given that he was black, I can guarantee you he was not part of many of the brotherhoods that I've come across that have to be dealt with in your analysis. And then I knew that when he appointed every banker he could get his hands on, from Goldman Sachs, B of A, he put more bankers in his administration than George Bush Sr., who comes from a banking family. And I knew then that what Obama was going to do is take this country further in the Bush W. direction than ever before, ever imaginable. But then I also said that he would be blamed for everything. And one day, the American people will forget 
that Obama took the Bush agenda even further than Bush could have, and the result will be in three years and several months, the American people will be prepped and ready to get rid of Obama and elect Jeb Bush to the White House. Wow, another Bush. This is another Bush. Unbelievable. I mean, what? it's like we have, we're, we're at a point where we have dynasties in this country. This is ridiculous. This is nothing like a, a republic or a democracy. What, what is it with these, these families controlling our government like this between the Kennedys and well, the Bushes? Know, there's always been a certain element of, of families that, you know, go back in time, even... Even the Buchanan administration had ties all the way back to George Washington. But, you know, this country was founded by a very small contingent of people that had history in Europe. Many of them came to this country, even though they were nobility or ex-nobility, they came to this country to found a new regime. So it doesn't surprise me that, you know, George Washington can be traced back to some you know, nefarious group on the European continent that somebody would call, you know, the Illuminati. These things are irrelevant to me. There's good men and there's bad men in everything, including brotherhoods and monarchies. There's good monarchs and bad monarchs. If you haven't read, you know, Marcus Aurelius, then you've missed the point. He's probably the finest man to ever lead a, a, a nation of that size, Rome, and everything he wrote about could be applied and it should have as in fact applicable to the United States. But yet in that same mix, you know, you get the Neros and the crazies and that's what we've got. You know, George Bush Senior, I know his connections, I knew what he was about, but he was explainable in the White House. George W, not even the family wanted him to run for president. They were opposed to it. So they had to accept the fact that he was he took the coattails of Jeb Bush was supposed to ride, and he got on him and managed to get himself elected out of sheer power in Karl Rove. Now, we're past that. We've got Obama. He's completely unconnected. So how does an Obama go forward when he has no connections, no power base? He's black. He's not white. I'm not a racist, but most of the country is. So he's lacking in a lot of, of the power structure that you would normally see. So he goes to what? Wall Street. The banking community, that banking community is, in the end, behind everything that matters. The banks, the largest monopoly banks, own 30% of the multinational corporations, the Fortune 400. Outright, almost 30% is owned by 11 banks. So you can't argue against the corporate structure without including the banking structure, which the progressive left, of course, has an absolute fit about, because if you bring up banking in this category, they immediately call you an anti-Semitic because they think you're talking about Jewish banks. Right, yeah. And, of course, that's not what we're talking about at all. In fact, I know full well that there's damn few Jews left in the banking system in the Western United States, uh, Western countries, including the United States. It was interesting to me, Craig, that that's how they tried to characterize Occupy Wall Street as anti-Semitic. Yeah, well, you know, partly it's because... When Occupy Wall Street hit, I understood what it was. A lot of my clients thought I would back it and endorse it and go public with it. And I explained to them that, you know, they were, by and large, they were Ron Paul followers, Cato Institute and the University of Chicago School of Economics, Milton Friedman crowd, and they were opposed to banking for all the correct reasons. There wasn't even an itch of anti-Semitism amongst them. In fact, many of them were Jewish. So they were opposed for the right reasons, but I also knew that because of the popularity they got so suddenly and that it was banking-oriented, that they would immediately be taken over by the progressive left. And that's why I said, I can't back them. They'll be taken over, and that movement about Wall Street will simply fade away because the left will make it about every other issue than banking. Yeah. Which they have. Which they have. Yeah, they've succeeded at doing that. One of the papers that you wrote, that, and I'm referring to the Nowhere to Run or Hide paper. Right. That, that's your document. Yeah. And you, you've got some really interesting stuff in here. Loosening up uh, of these uh, passport controls for, for Saudis. What is going on with that? Well, sometime back I produced a paper and the documentation again, the lawsuit and the documents on the Saudi regime are on the website. There was a lawsuit filed by Lloyds of London against the Saudi royal family, the Saudi banks, and the Saudi intelligence community, the Secret Service, but the Saudi royal family was included because they control everything in the Saudi government. 
And the lawsuit claimed, and if you read it, it's it's lengthy. The lawsuit claimed that they they took the claims and paid off the claims of victims of the 9/11 disaster. All four flights, the victims, the families of people who died, were all paid off. Lloyd's of London carried the insurance policy. So Lloyd's, it's called 3500 Syndicate, is the branch of Lloyd's filed a lawsuit against the Saudis for recovery of those funds, and they document just systematically in a way that nobody else has even come close to that the Saudi government funded and was behind the 9-11 attacks, not bin Laden, not anything called al-Qaeda, that it was done by the Saudi regime in conjunction with its intelligence service and charitable organizations. And the documentation is absolutely irrefutable. It's incredible how much detail these lawyers put forward in one document where if you were to try to do a search and find each one of these items, which I did to verify it, it's spread all over the place. Sometimes it was the FBI. It could have been a single reporter in the Miami Herald. But they got everything and put it in one lawsuit. They released it on a Sunday night. Monday morning, it was filed. It was released publicly on a Sunday night. I immediately got a copy of it. By Thursday, the Saudis had paid off and made a settlement, paid off the lawsuit. It was dead in the water by Friday. And Friday, Obama was seen in a photograph with the Saudi prince and head of the intelligence arm of the royal family and the government saying that we have a special relationship with Saudi Arabia. <laughs> That's just a man. I mean, That's you, how you, you couldn't write this as fiction. It's so ridiculous, isn't it? No, you'd have to put George Clooney in it, and he'd be dead at the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> It's incredible. Like I said, this is the speed with which the regime is now feeling it is necessary to move. And that's why Feinstein and Obama went after guns so vociferously. By the way, that's not over. I understand it was taken out of the Senate bill. To, yeah, the last she, she'll, she'll be back. There's no she'll question about back. it. You know, she, she, she was doing it years she, ago. Yeah. Every year she, she, she submits it. And there'll be a House bill. By someone else, Schumer, someone else will will do a House bill. I agree. I agree. No question about it. And uh, and you know, where is the outrage against drunk drivers and highway safety, other issues, medical malpractice? Well, actually, more people die from drowning. Uh, uh, yeah, of course. Than from it's it's absurd. It's just it makes no sense whatsoever. And you know, I've read some theories about these shootings in general, and I don't know if you touch on that at all. It's probably not worth discussing too much. But how those seem to be setups and well, I, largely I, staged. I ignore those kinds of things because you find yourself in an area of concern that is impossible. These are these are criminal acts done by people who are whack jobs or. Sirhan Sirhan has been reignited. His lawyer brought him forward with new evidence to reopen the case on the killing of Bobby Kennedy. And that has gotten no press whatsoever. And his argument is that he was hypnotized, that he was manipulated, that not one bullet was fired from the gun they confiscated from him. And if you go back and you look at a movie that was done, and I'm no big fan of Hollywood movies, but Emilio Estevez did a movie called Bobby, and if you look at it, there's no hype, there's no Oliver Stone conspiracy theory, but if you're paying attention to the movie, as well as you should pay attention to reality of things that happen when they assassinate somebody in this country, you'll see that that Emilio Estevez made the argument for Sirhan Sirhan not having killed Bobby Kennedy at all. It was an impossible task. In fact, he tracks where all the bullets actually went from that particular gun. Not one of them hit Bobby Kennedy. So, in other words, he proves that there's a second shooter, which is now this lawyer's um, argument in behalf of Sirhan Sirhan. Now, it's, it's going to go nowhere. I know that. It's not going to happen. Nobody's going to go down. The system is too corrupt now to be taken out by a single entity exposing wrongdoing, like I said. They've, they'll, they're willing to violate the First, Second, Fourth, Fifth, Eighth Amendment right in your face with bills and legislations and memorandums from the White House saying, pass this bill. I'm talking about the National Defense Authorization Act. I have a memo on my website that came directly from the Obama administration demanding that it be left in the National Defense Authorization Act, that paragraph, that section 
that says that American citizens can be arrested, detained indefinitely, without habeas corpus, with a single-issue order from the White House. That's in the bill. They were threatened with veto if they didn't leave it in, so Obama personally intervened to see that it was there. And, of course, it's a violation of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, blatantly a violation. And Eric Holder upheld it when he was questioned, and they've gone so far as Eric Holder, I have two letters from him saying not only that, but if the president decides he has to kill an American on American soil because we believe he has terrorist connections or is a suspect, we do not have to reveal the evidence, and we have the right to assassinate him. Unbelievable. Without revealing the evidence. It is amazing how little press the NDAA got when it was passed. I mean, it's just shocking to me. And I, that happened right before the election, too, as I recall. I mean, I think it was right before. Well, maybe that's why it got so little press. Well, uh, good Most point. Of the press are, in fact, the mainstream press, a great number of them, as, in, as editors and reporters, they are diehard. They're Democrats. They're diehard Democrats. But you'll notice not even Fox or Bill O'Reilly or Rush Limbaugh went after the issue on a nationwide scale either. Nobody really wanted to touch it. They're part of the corporate media, too. It's, it's like the same power structure. They have to pander as well. It's amazing. Well, they do what I call, don't make an argument about things that don't matter. Okay, things like abortion, uh, gay marriage, they will, they will take an opposing be, a view on things that I call things that don't matter. But on things that matter, like the loss of habeas corpus and the president of the United States usurping this kind of power from the Constitution, where due process is the very crux of the Constitution. In fact, habeas corpus goes back to the Magna Carta. That's where, we, that's where Thomas Paine and Jefferson derived it from. So you couldn't be arrested or detained or killed for a crime without having the right to be seen before a judge. So on the things that matter, no. Not even a right-wing Republican will oppose the administration, whether it's Democrat or Republican. It's just a shocking time in which we live. I mean, Craig, what is with all of these agencies stocking up on bullets and even armored vehicles? I mean, this is just crazy. The IRS, Homeland Security, of course, I think even the CDC. What's going on? They're all stocking up on ammunition because every federal agency has an enforcement arm. Now, the Department of Education, they only needed 500,000 rounds, so that wasn't terribly shocking to most people. But when Home Science Security purchased 1.6 billion rounds of 40 caliber and 9 millimeter hollow points, then even Forbes magazine wrote an article and said, the editors wrote an article collectively and said, I think it's time we have a, a public dialogue about this. Because this ammo isn't training ammo. This is expensive. Right. This is a buck a bullet ammo. And they've got enough ammo to fight two Gulf Wars. And yet it's Homeland Security, personally, who's purchased the ammo. Then, after that, they purchased 7,000 AR-15s. The very rifle that they want outlaw. That yeah. Biden, Biden actually said that rifle is not, and American people do not need that rifle. What you need to go do is go out and get yourself a double-barreled shotgun to protect yourself, because nobody needs an M4. <laughs> yes. yeah. But the M4 was stated in the request for the purchase of them. It was stated clearly that the reason for the purchase was because it's an excellent weapon for home defense. It praised its 30-round capacity magazine, because often in home defense there's more than one perpetrator. And it said the 16-inch barrel... And the round, the 223 round, was excellent self-defense in a closed, confined area, as proven by our house-to-house -house warfare in places like Iraq. But they refer to it as a PDW in the purchase order. So the PDW goes to 7,000 Homeland Security employees for a personal defense weapon. And yet they, they say, the same people say, you and I do not have a right to have that rifle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of the manufacturers I just heard recently are saying, look, we're not going to, I love this, by the way, they're saying we're not going to sell our guns to the government if people aren't, if regular citizens aren't allowed to buy them either. I think that might have been the turning point why that section of the Senate bill on assault weapons may have been taken out. 
because the, the rebellion out here on the streets about the Second Amendment, in part, I would like to take credit for it. A lot of people think I should, but I was on coast to coast. Then I did Salt Lake. I did Oregon. I did New Jersey and D.C. And I explained that the sheriffs, the sheriffs have the right and the capability to stop any federal law enforcement agency that comes into their county and tries to enforce a law that violates the Constitution, because I've seen it done. I've seen DEA and ATF agents run out of town by a county sheriff, and he didn't like the way they were handling the job in his county. He'll escort them to the, to the county line and say, get the hell out of my town. And I riled up enough sheriffs, I guess, off coast to coast and a couple of other shows. I did D.C. Live um, with Carl Nelson, Mills Crenshaw in Salt Lake. 26 out of 27 sheriffs signed a letter the day later in, in, in Salt Lake. 26 out of 27 signed a letter saying that we will take a bullet before we will allow federal agents to come and confiscate semi-automatic rifles from our citizens. So there was a fast uprising. There's also now 11 states. There's already three have passed it. Uh, the Dakota, Missouri, and Salt Lake have already passed legislation that would indicate that if you tried to enforce the violation of the Second Amendment and confiscate guns already owned by their citizens in the state, the state police, and if necessary, the governor will call out the militia, and they will arrest those agents and try them for a felony. That's unbelievable. I mean, history doesn't show that happening, though. You know, when push comes to shove, the, all of the citizens that work in law enforcement or government will oppress their fellow citizens. I mean, at least historically, that's been the way that it's gone. That has been true, yeah. except, of course, the Civil War. That's why a lot of people have drawn the analogy that, that Obama began violating singular uh, ben, uh, Bill of Rights, you know, First Amendment, Third Amendment, you know, Fifth Amendment, Third Amendment, I'm sorry, was the only one not violated, and I'll let you figure that one out. But every other category of the first ten articles of the Bill of Rights, he began violating and infringing upon them systematically. When he got to the Second Amendment, now you've riled up a different sector of the population, completely different sector. A lot of people on the right that own guns are not political. That's one of the great failings of the National Rifle Association, because other than on gun issues, the NRA never opposes the government on anything else. Well, the progressive left does. They oppose the government on, on the National Defense Authorization Act. They oppose the government when they passed H.R. 314 that made it illegal for you to protest any building or presence of, of the president, according to the Secret Service, if within 300 yards of the building where they were giving a lecture or having a meeting, which immediately violates your right to assemble and speak and protest against your very government. Now, you could do it in Des Moines, but you can't do it where President Obama is. So what good is it? You can't get anywhere near where the action is. Right. Well, in other words, you also won't be anywhere near the, where the press is. Right. right. Yeah. So your course. protest is moot. And, and they claim it's uh, security reasons. Of course they do. And of course they do. And that's what they're going to claim the drones are. The, the drones are, they've already said it in North Dakota, they use the drone to harass and bring down a rancher who had, he had collected some cows on his property, and he wouldn't give them up. His family was armed, so they sent in the SWAT teams. They issued a warrant for his arrest, but they never issued a warrant for the use of the drone. They used the drone to target the family, separate the family, and harass the family. Now, when it was, the question was raised locally that there was no warrant issued by a judge to use that drone the SWAT team commander simply said, well, it was here to protect our SWAT team members, not the people being arrested. So right now, though, they have to have a warrant to use a, a drone? That is the law, not saying that they're obeying it, but that's, that's the rule now? That would be the hope, but then each municipality, each state, each agency will write its own management, its own. There's no overall principle or plan issued by Homeland Security or FEMA or the White House that indicates how the drone must be used and comply to U.S. law. There's nothing, nothing in writing about any of that. And I don't suspect there will be for a very long time. And if it is, initially, it'll be housed in the same breath as the use of drones overseas, secret kill lists. 
with no oversight. There aren't enough words for this, Craig. It's it's just unbelievable. It's unbelievably scary. I mean, when this technology is fully implemented, it may close the window forever. Whoever gets control of this, meaning our government in this case, it's checkmate. There's no fighting off drones if there should be another civil war. Well, actually, you know, I've heard that often. In fact, let me let me start by saying this. Naomi Wolf, Michael Moore, Chris Hedges, Ariana Huffington, Amy Goodman, Noam Chomsky, all of these people on the progressive left have articles, they have TV, radio shows, they do interviews, they're published. They're well known. All of them are arguing and have been arguing for years that America is becoming a national security state, that we're becoming a fascist regime. In fact, Naomi Wolf just said that in the London Guardian, that America is becoming a fascist regime. Yet, when you raise the question of the Second Amendment and taking guns away from the American people, they say, yes, take the guns away. That's a massive contradiction in analysis. I, I've never understood. The, the leftist politics have never made any sense to me. I, I just think find them to be completely illogical, <laughs> at least on but the right. On the case of the civil liberties, they've got it correct. They've got the NDAA right. They've got the abuse of authority, not allowing protests within 300 yards where the Secret Service precludes it. They've got it right about base closures and realignment, FEMA camps. They've got it right about a lot of things. But then all of a sudden, your Second Amendment rights come up. They say, no, ban the guns. So I've had to look at that and try to understand that from a completely different, different outlook. It seems to me that the one thing the American people are missing is they don't understand the ideological basis for these groups to protest. That's why the right wing always falls down on the job when it comes to civil liberties. I, I don't know why. If you're a libertarian like Ron Paul, you're considered a right wing anti Semite, homophobic, you know, right along with the Ku Klux Klan. Makes no sense. But ideologically, I've known Ron Paul for 35 years. I cut my teeth. He was the first person I talked to in Houston when I had my corporation in Houston called Pen and Quill. I went to Ron Paul, and I wanted to give him money, and I wanted, I wanted involved in politics because after Vietnam, I was a combat vet. I, I feared for my country at that time because I was in the corporate world, and I saw the, the direction the country was going in the corporate world. And that bothered me. So I went to him. And since then, we've remained friends. He's none of the things the progressive left calls him. But because he's against abortion, he has no opinion one way or the other about gay marriage. He could care less, like me. I could care less. By not caring about that issue, you're immediately a right winger. So that's why we have no group um, forming on the left and the right to oppose the blanket violation of civil liberties. The right wing is isolated because of a few issues that the progressive left cannot allow you to be protesting along with them because so many of them are, in fact, gay and lesbian. They are, in fact, not who they say they are. They are heavily involved in drug usage, so they are, of course, very vociferous about the legalization of drugs, so the right wing and the left will never come together because of those kinds of issues. And that's sad because the argument you just made is that the drones, I've heard this from the left all the time, take away the guns because even if they have the right to keep and bear arms, you could never fight the most powerful military in the world. They have MRAPs now, 1,600 MRAPs. These are giant armored personnel carriers with gun ports have been purchased by Homeland Security, right along with the ammo and the rifles. These are huge vehicles decommissioned from Baghdad and Afghanistan by the Pentagon and the Marines and are now in Homeland Security's possession and deployed all across America to support federal, local, and state law enforcement at the Homeland level. Uh, level. Now, the left will say, you can't oppose that. You'll never be able to oppose that. Really? Try Afghanistan. I'm sorry, they're doing a hell of If you think the American people could not defend itself as a people against our own government, you are sadly mistaken. We have millions of men military trained. We have millions more that they can outshoot some of the snipers, the elk hunters, the bear hunters. 
So, you know, don't tell me America is this country that can't come together. And if the sheriff and the government governor calls out the militia and says, you know what, the federal government can't come into this state and arrest its citizens in violation of the Constitution, well, you've got a civil war on your hands. Well, and, and I think what ultimately needs to happen is is a secession and a, and a real states' rights movement. And that, that I think think we may well see in our lifetimes. Well, we may see. We may see it, and it will be violent, because whether it's Obama or whether it's Jeb Bush in the White House... They're not going to let it happen, right? They're not going to let that, that, that happen. He, any more than they would allow Texas and Arizona, who are already making rumblings, that they're going to make gold and silver legal tender and issue their own currency. That, that'll that trigger the federal government. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Well, hey, Craig, I, uh, I, I've got to get running, and I know you do soon, too. You've got a bunch of interviews stacked up. But I wanted to ask you about one final topic, and that's the economy and this financial Nazism that you talk about. If you could just touch on, on some of the economic points, that would be great. Well, I think the economy has no chance of recovery because $43 trillion have been, been taken directly out of the Treasury and the Federal Reserve and given to the largest banks and corporations. That document is a levy document, number six, uh, 628, I believe. It's a PDF file on my website as well. They, they're arguing that about $40 trillion have been bled from the economy, given to the wealthiest banks and corporations. That money's disappeared. It's overseas in some, something in the neighborhood of 7,000 tax havens, never to be returned. Well, an economy cannot recover after it's had that happen to it. And nobody's admitting it in the media because, like I said, the people most culpable for it are Goldman Sachs, former Goldman Sachs employees, which makes them former Obama and Bush administration executives. So we've got a government run by bankers, owned by bankers, and we've been built by the bankers. And even though there's been lawsuit after lawsuit indicting and convicting the banks of money laundering, drug dealing money laundering, taking money, ripping homeowners off, and they've been found guilty. Not one individual within the, within the financial industry has been arrested or indicted. Not one man or woman, just the banks have been fined a nickel. Yeah, uh, relatively speaking, a nickel. And Anthony Mozilla, too, a nickel for him as well. So so how, how is the economy going to recover, and how do we get out from under the thumb of a financial regime that is scrutinizing every single transaction you make, and whether it's electronic funds transfer or a dollar? They're coordinating efforts where the, the level of surveillance of the American citizens in financial dealings in Illinois, they just made it a law that you have to register every gold and silver transaction you make within the state. I expect that's going to take place in every state at the federal level. They want to know where every single penny is because in their thinking, and it's correct, it's their money. It's not yours. That is a scary thought. It really is. Uh, Any tips on what we can do about it? Well, if you're buying gold and silver and you've got all your debts paid, which, you know, I think you should do first, get completely out of debt, protect your family from the IRS and from the the, the prospect of any kind of economic collapse, uh, then buy gold and silver. But even if you do have gold and silver at this point, you better be paying attention to the laws, both state and local and federal, that would confiscate that gold or make it illegal to use it except on the black market, which already is illegal, according to the IRS. If you barter and not file taxes on the the profit you make in a barter transaction, you're in violation. So, yeah, what I refer to in, in that article, or repeated from another person's statement of it, there is a kind of financial fascism, a financial Nazism coming in our direction, and it's coming from the ability to surveil you within the Internet, within Facebook, National Security Agency. Now, according to William Biney, I have a videotape on my website, William Biney, two whistleblowers, every single email, every single transaction, every single cell phone conversation is being downloaded and put together in a package, in a file, on every single American, and it has been doing that for a decade. 
these whistleblowers have gone public with it. And believe it or not, the, there's an increase in traffic on Facebook, even though that's one of the targets for the FBI for facial recognition and the NSA for collecting data illegally on all the Americans and all their activities, cell phones, emails, transactions. But the American people are completely oblivious that this is even going on. That's why you can't generate a law that would prescribe it. No congressman is going to put forward a law to prescribe something that the American people aren't even aware is being going on. It won't have a chance. It is really amazing. I mean, I, I read that long, long time ago that the CIA was one of the original investors in Facebook to use it as a data mining project. <laughs> it's just people and, and just course, willingly do it. it nobody you know. would believe you. Yeah, I know. I know. But it's now just... there's three whistleblowers that have come out publicly. All three of them, by the way, have been harassed. One of them has been indicted. One whistleblower on use of torture is in jail. Obama has prosecuted more whistleblowers in less than four years than all other presidents combined. So, you know, we have to face the reality. We've got a man in the White House that is more of a tyrant than George Bush Jr. Yeah, no question about it. And he he was the one who promised transparency, using technology, the internet. Every new piece of legislation will be on the internet for five business days so the American people can interact and read all the details. And then one of his first big quote-unquote victories is Obamacare and, and, and Pelosi saying, well, we have to pass the bill to see what's in it. You know, it's just absurd and it's just it's just crazy. Well, Craig, I'm glad there are people out li- out there like you doing what you're doing. Please give out your website and tell people how, how they can learn more about your work. And I believe you have a book as well, right? I have I have four books out that are still in. Well, one of them is not in print any longer, and I have a new book coming out um, this year. But you can just go to Craig B. Hewlett H U L E T, not like Hewlett Packard. It's Craig B. Hewlett, H-U-L-E-T, CraigBHewlett.com. Everything is there. My bio is there. And you don't have to pay for anything. Fantastic. Well, speaking of that, actually, I, I saw one of your books on Amazon, and I guess that's the out-of-print book, uh, the Hydra book, I think, and it was like $300. Uh, that's becoming a, a collector's item, isn't it? Well, that's a, that's a shame, you know, and I think I'll put a stop to that. I've already been I've already been pondering. I just have not had time to look at it seriously. But I think I'll turn the book into a Kindle book and offer it for like 10 bucks. It's an outrage. It's somebody, actually several people bought up 10 or 20 copies, and they're peddling them. Just it's outrageous, you know. I don't even believe the book is worth that. Well, <laughs> that's uh, yeah. Well, it's good that you have control over that. But hey, Craig, keep doing what you do, and I'll I'll keep listening to you uh, on on your other channels and so forth, your media outlets that you're on, and we appreciate having you on the show. Thanks so much. Anytime. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn about investing in and managing income properties for college students, there's a show for that. If you want to learn how to get noticed online and in social media, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to save on life's largest expense, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know about America's crime of the century, there's even a show for that. Yep. There's a show for just about anything, only from jasonhartman.com, or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. Thank you for joining us today for the Holistic Survival Show, protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Be sure to listen to our Creating Wealth Show, which focuses on exploiting the financial and wealth creation opportunities in today's economy. Learn more at www.jasonhartman.com or search Jason Hartman on iTunes. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, offering very general guidelines and information. Opinions of guests are their own, and none of the content should be considered individual advice. If you require personalized advice, please consult an appropriate professional. Information deemed reliable, but not guaranteed.